Okay, up next is actually on peptides. So, well, as you can see from your notes, there's not that many because uh, it's basically a new incorporation, same with protein docking from last year. So, I incorporated uh, this topic because peptide study is becoming favorable nowadays, at least since a few years back. And, well, I think it would be a good contribution to the proteomics part. So, let's start. So, what are peptides? I'm sure you guys know what peptides are. So, first, uh, I mean, primary structure of a protein are made of polypeptides. So, it is a short polymer of amino acids joined by your peptide bond. And peptides are usually classified by the number of amino acids in the chain. Okay? So, it could be either a dipeptide, okay, which is a molecule containing two amino acids joined by the peptide bond, or tripeptide, okay, whereby it has three amino acids joined by the peptide bond, or oligopeptide, okay, around 12 to 20 residues, okay, whereby each unit comprised of amino acids joined okay, by peptide bond. So, when you get polypeptide, okay, this is from your primary structure of a protein. So, it is a macromolecule containing many amino acids and basically it would be more than 20 residues sometimes. So, it is also in the form of linear polymers, no branches, uh, primary structure, remember, and amino acid monomers are usually linked head to tail through formation of peptide bonds, if you remember how they are connected, okay, from the fundamentals. So, what are the functions of peptides? Peptides have a wide range of functions in the human body, uh, which a lot of people actually don't know or don't realize. So it is also important in muscle building. Uh, anyone interested okay, in building muscles, guys, and so forth, okay? For example, GHRP peptide is one of the finest human growth hormone releases, okay? To make sure, okay, that you could build up your muscle. So peptides are also capable or basically could be used, okay, to raise prolactin hormone, especially in females and prolactin hormone okay is actually especially important okay for uh, women with baby breastfeeding babies apart from that copper based peptides are responsible for giving us flawless skin and protecting us from harsh sunny conditions okay isn't that interesting now apart from that some peptides okay like okay ipomoralin okay are used uh, to treat hunger issues but uh, probably this is still being infancy is still in infancy studies okay and there are also other peptides okay used to treat injuries for example hexarelin okay has a pretty attractive healing properties now these are some of other functions of peptides okay and there are a whole lot more but i couldn't possibly list each and one of them i'm just listing everything that is important and well have an interest okay to me as well so Hormones and pheromones, which is quite common, okay, because we know that they are enzymes are involved, so proteins are involved, and there are peptides, okay, that basically could be made or could be obtained from it. Insulin, so of course, think sugar. Anyone diabetic over here? Or you didn't know that you are diabetic? So don't think that because you are young, you won't have it. Okay, so go and check. Oxytoxin, oh, T O X I N, sorry about that, okay. Think about childbirth, okay? So it's basically a kind of compound, okay, being used, okay, kind of like epidural, okay, to assist in childbirth. Sex peptide, okay? Think fruit fly mating, okay? Don't think outside the box too much, <laughs> right? Neuropeptides, okay, are involved in basically your nervous system, okay? Substance P, a pain mediator antibiotics and there's a lot of antibiotics okay polymycin b for gram negative bacteria for gram positive we have bacitracin okay we also have protection for example toxins against toxins we have amanitin okay which is from mushroom now did you guys know that amanitin is actually an inhibitor to rna polymerase 2 okay, in eukaryote so we also have okay contoxin from cone snails and if you are interested okay you can find out what is the use of contoxin the same goes with chlorotoxin from scorpion now what are the properties of peptides so we know that peptides could be found in nature okay? and they are either products of protein hydrolysis or biologically active peptides so when they are hydrolyzed okay usually you could get different forms of hydrolyzed peptides for example oxytoxin okay, uh, basically is a hormone made up of nine amino acid residues and glucagon is also another hormone made up of 29 amino acid residues and apart from that, we also have glutathione. I'm sure some of the girls and ladies would have heard of glutathione, okay? which is a very important antioxidant made up of three 
only three amino acid residues okay but it's actually important okay to give you a fair skin so amino acids okay in a peptide are of course okay, referred to as amino acid residues so the amino acid residues at the end of the free uh, alpha amino group again okay, is the amino terminal or n terminal residue again okay, and the residue at the other end again okay, is the alpha carboxyl okay or the c terminal residues okay so this is one of the questions i ask you during our online class so peptides contain only one free alpha amino group and one free alpha carboxyl group one at each end of the chain so for peptides okay, usually it have a high melting temperature and of course have very specific pi values because it contain very specific amino acids so it have either a basic or acidic properties acid base behavior of a peptide usually can be predicted from its free uh, alpha amino or alpha carboxyl group and of course okay from the ionizable groups of its side chain and especially if it is basic or acidic so apart from that the r group okay could also contribute okay to the properties okay whereby okay when it contains an ionizable group okay for example addition of carboxyl or amino group okay it will contribute to the overall acid base behavior of your peptide so of course okay when you proceed with some titration curves again okay, in the lab to determine the amino acid composition it could have uh, similarities to amino acids now what are bioactive peptides anyone have heard of bioactive peptides if anyone have heard of bioactive peptides okay you probably you can just tell me what is your opinion or what do you think of bioactive peptides okay underneath the video uh, kind of like in a comment because uh I think a lot of people okay, are now aware of bioactive peptides but they don't actually know how bioactive peptides are derived, what are the uses, how it could be used efficiently. So with that, okay, usually bioactive peptides are the result of either one of these enzymatic proteolysis of proteins, okay, for example from your gastrointestinal digestion or in vitro hydrolysis uh, by proteolytic enzymes. Remember the uh, demonstration on in silico digestion okay so it's actually one of the enzymatic proteolysis secondly food processing okay either from cooking fermentation or ripening only these three processes okay so and cooking which means that any type of cooking just heating boiling steaming and whatnot okay so these processes okay, contribute to the formation of bioactive peptides because okay you can get the whole structure of a protein but again okay, by processing okay cooking or fermentation or ripening it would basically break down some of the bonds or some of the interaction remember the five interactions and bonds okay from your protein structure okay so those okay basically are broken down okay to give you bioactive peptides so bioactive peptides okay are able to inhibit protein protein direction due to their small size and specificity okay so it could be sometimes of only two amino acids okay two up until 12 to 20 uh, amino acid residues so bioactive peptides could be obtained from either plants animals fungi microbes and also their products so a lot of times okay, people thought bioactive peptides could only be obtained from food okay so food okay could mean it could be from plants or animals or fungi or microbes okay and microbes are something that people actually don't know that they could get bioactive peptides from so there are lots of bioactive peptides in foods okay which i think that's why okay, a lot of people are more aware of okay coming conscious okay especially those health conscious people so how do you obtain bioactive peptides very simple from two processes i've mentioned earlier on from the uh, previous slide so protein hydrolysis okay should or could be obtained via proteolytic enzymes in the wet lab again okay, whereby you could get okay, the result of in the form of hydrolysis okay whereby you can get many peptide fragments in it so we call it as a hydrolysis for bacterial fermentation okay same mechanism as above okay which means that they are usually broken down okay from uh, whatever is enzyme that is available proteolytic enzymes okay, during the fermentation process so to determine the biological activity, usually the hydrolysis okay, will be tested in vitro okay, or in vivo. Usually people do in vitro because it's easier as compared to in vivo whereby, well, especially if you're testing it on animals, so you need to have ethical committee. Now, bioactive peptides okay, function. Uh, I'm not sure why the rest of the function <laughs> is not here. Okay, sorry about that. So basically, okay, uh, usage of bioactive uh, hydrolysis are as such as functional food okay, to obtain or to give consumers high quality food 
doesn't mean that if it doesn't contain bioactive peptides, okay, it's not high quality. It could be high quality, especially if it's organic. But again, okay, bioactive peptides okay, have certain activities to enhance, for example, antioxidant and so forth. Apart from that, bioactive peptides in the hydrolysis okay, could also be used for nutraceuticals. Okay? Uh, think about non-pharmacology and nutraceuticals. Okay? Think about cosmetics. Okay, for those okay, who are interested. And of course, okay, not forgetting therapeutic purposes. So simply said, okay, what I would more or less summarize, again, okay, bioactive peptides are fragments of protein, okay, refer here, okay, that are not active in the sequence of the precursors, but after enzymatic release, after proteolytic enzyme uh, hydrolysis, okay, they interact with the receptors to regulate the body function. Okay? So this is also okay, a quote okay, taken basically by uh, Kolakowski okay, from 2005. Now, let's have a look at the properties of bioactive peptides. So uh, there are a lot of properties, but I'm only highlighting those that are important and some of those that I'm actually studying first. Up, okay, up first, okay, is actually antioxidant activity because I think everyone is well aware of antioxidant nowadays, especially as uh, free radicals, the, the effect of free radicals. So the presence of aromatic amino acids okay, is basically a contributor okay, to the antioxidant activity. It could scavenge free radicals, okay, which is harmful to your body okay, and also to the environment. What it could do, some of the bioactive peptides okay, with antioxidant activity okay, is that it could chelate okay, the metals okay to a transition metals that is suitable okay for your body to either ingest okay or to be used okay or to be broken down apart from that again okay, it could be used as a reduction of hydro peroxides okay, and also as oxidant elimination so antioxidants are the one that is desirable oxidants are the one that is not needed okay but you get it from some of the reaction okay oxidoreductase okay so basically okay, you need to eliminate them so back to peptides okay, some of them could eliminate oxidants for high anti-hypertensive uh, activity, think about, uh, well, those with high blood pressure, okay, so hypertensive. So it inhibits ACE, okay, mainly found in egg albumin, okay, so ACE is basically a form of protein, okay, uh, involved in anti-hypertensive activity. So it is well absorbed, okay, by the intestine and could be very useful. And of course, uh, who would forget okay, if any of uh, the bioactive peptides okay, have any anti-tumor activity? Now, bear in mind that anti-cancer and anti-tumor are two different things. Okay? Usually, pe when people refer to anti-tumor, it's actually the formation of the tumor. Okay? So tumor could be cancerous, could not, uh, or sometimes it could be cancerous. So what I meant here is anti-tumor activity. So some of the bioactive peptides okay, have the capability to inhibit the proliferation of the tumor cells. Okay, which is crucial because sometimes it could be cancerous, like I said. It could also increase intracellular GSH, a home, sorry, not a hormone, uh, an enzyme, okay, basically used okay, to inhibit okay, the proliferation. And of course, okay, most of the time, okay, the bioactive peptides for anti tumor activity are present mainly in egg of a museum. So another uh, popular properties of bioactive peptides are those that involve in antimicrobial activity because Everything nowadays, okay, people desire it to be uh, antimicrobial, especially when you buy stuff, you buy food, you want it to be antimicrobial so that it could last for a certain period of time and also it could protect you. So some of the bioactive peptides okay, are basically mainly due to the, uh, with my antimicrobial activity, are mainly due to tryptophan and arginine, the two amino acids. And they could bind to cell liposaccharide wall, okay? Uh, so they could either have a bactericidal activity or antiviral activity, which is of course desirable, but not many actually have it. So this is basically uh, an overall distribution okay, of uh, the number okay, of bacteria, archaea, fungi, plants, and animals with uh, bioactive peptides okay, with antimicrobial activity. This is basically in terms of the number of peptides. Now, antimicrobial, so not to be confused okay, with this one, okay? So the mechanism of action, okay, is that okay, usually when you have an antimicrobial uh, bioactive peptide or bacteroactive peptide activity uh, with antimicrobial activity, what it could use, okay, is that either two way, okay, either direct chelate, uh, so follow on this, okay, or it could basically use, okay, to modulate the immunity or immune system. So it could work both ways, and it depends on the type of 
by activity that the peptides could have raised on. So this usually needs to be further studied because it could have two mechanisms of action. So usually if by direct killing, uh, it would be the most common form of bioactive peptides with antimicrobial activity. The one that basically modulate your immunization, that's quite hard to find, but there are some bioactivity, uh, bioactive peptides that have been identified with this form of action, but uh, not that many, as many as the one with the direct killing. Now, whether you prefer this or this, okay, it actually depends from one person to another because for this, it actually seems like very obvious so you just direct kill okay, the microbe okay, and then you can get rid of the problem but okay, the thing is that you can just get rid of the microbe but what microbe does okay, is that probably not all of them would be killed off okay, some would probably still sustain and it would adapt and it could mutate to a better one and probably you need to find another bioactive peptide for that as compared to this and I'm not saying that immune modulation would be better, but okay, because this could also have some impact on some person because it involves your immune response system, so it could have a reaction in your body as well. Now, the next properties are metal binding property. Now, because I think a lot of people, because when they are health conscious nowadays, okay, they would be more aware okay, of where they got their food from, especially if it's non-organic, we know that when they use pesticide, okay, so there are metals uh, that could probably be deposited, and there are metals everywhere from the soil, okay, and the nutrients absorbed, okay, from the plant itself anyway. So, okay, for bioactive peptides, okay, with metal binding property, it could increase the bioavailability, bioavailability of certain minerals that is desirable, okay, and it could also prevent the oxidation because certain metals, okay, it would increase a uh, higher oxidation and you could get oxidants in turn. Okay? So, well, then you need to have an antioxidant you to overcome it. So, it could also increase calcium absorption and this would be useful for those who basically have problems with calcium absorption, especially the ladies. Now, for bioactive peptides with immunostimulating activity, so, of course, okay, it has immuno modulating effect okay, and mostly they are derived from milk okay so basically this okay could stimulate okay, your immune activity but don't place your hope too much on this because chances are there are a lot of other things that needs to be involved for them to work properly so peptides from fruit okay and the application is basically quite wide okay these are some of them okay that i've listed out so it could prevent adverse changes in food products because nowadays you could buy food and it could last a certain times right and i think you guys would have heard whereby when you buy mcdonald's you can just leave it for a few days few weeks or a few years and nothing changes <laughs> okay so well that actually could be used for that but in case of mcdonald's i'm not saying anything so it could also prevent disease caused by oxidative stress okay which is very crucial it could basically have multifunctional character because sometimes like one bioactive peptides it could have more than one function it could also be involved in inactivation of herpes virus which is important crucial because when you get herpes uh, you are stuck with it for life so nutritional supplements of course okay, which is what people search for nowadays and pharma for pharmacological preparations it is important especially for drug lines to prevent osteoporosis okay to delay the aging process and also to reduce the risk of thrombotic disease so how about peptide bioinformatics so we have uh, come across protein docking do we have a okay, peptide docking okay? well whether it's good news or not okay, to some of you yes we do have peptide bioinformatics uh, when i introduced this topic last year okay, a lot of students was like ah oh, do we have another docking so i know a lot of people don't really like docking okay but unfortunately there is a peptide docking of peptide bioinformatics so these are the steps okay to peptide protein docking or protein peptide docking whichever way you want to say it so there are eight steps okay but <clears throat> basically uh, some of them are a combination okay from the steps that you have seen from protein docking so first and foremost okay you need to do what i demonstrated to you okay in our online class like okay, a few weeks ago which is okay in silico the chest of the protein sequence using suitable proteases so there are lots of proteases to choose from choose it wisely so different proteases okay, may be used okay, for in silico digestion to bind the best peptides. So that's why okay, I was saying okay, these two up until three okay, basically are actually just uh, in one step. Okay, but I basically just, well, I mean spread it out. So 
once you have done step one and step two, okay, you can use a peptide ranker. This is a site, okay. Oh, why did I have one M here? Okay, you can use a peptide ranker, okay? and this is a tool, and there are a few tools, okay, whereby they could rank okay, your peptide and giving you the value, a threshold score, okay, whereby to determine whether it could be bioactive or not. And you can check each of the peptide produced, okay, from the in silico suggestion. I will have a demonstration for this. I think I would be doing this, okay, probably just this week when we cover this as well. So, once again, you have basically checked it using peptide ranker. Peptides with a value of 0 0.8 are the only ones that are acceptable, okay, 0 0.8 and above. Okay, anything below 0 0.8 are usually uh, not acceptable as bioactive. Okay, so there are threshold, there are requirements. So later on, again, when I do the demonstration, you can just read on, on some of uh, the introduction of the peptide ranker. So the next one okay, is to check the peptides with an acceptable score in the peptide data set from several peptide databases. So not to make your life difficult, apart from the many databases that I've basically talked about in the, in the video okay, on the database, okay, we also have peptide database which I didn't put in the video. So peptide databases are becoming much larger nowadays. Okay? There are lots of databases available for you. So if your peptide okay, is found in the database, you could proceed with peptide protein docking. Okay, if not, then don't okay, because chances are you will have a problem determining the site for the docking. So if the peptide is not found in the database, determine the pot you could also do that, okay, but you need to determine the possible binding site of the peptide to the protein of interest. And you could always play around with it. Okay? And the last step is of course to perform protein peptide docking. So what I would have here if you were to compare it with protein docking is that we don't have the evaluation because Protein peptide docking is still considered fairly new okay, to a lot of bioinformaticians and to protein people. Even for me, it's still quite new, even though it has been here for about a few years, four to five years. But, uh, and so there is no evaluation method okay, to evaluate it as yet, okay, but okay, usually they just uh, evaluate it based on the best score, and that would be it. So, now let's have a side-by-side -side look okay, of protein protein versus protein peptide docking. What are they and how they are different? So for protein ligand, okay, usually you need to prepare a ligand. Okay? Uh, well, a, for the protein peptide, okay, you need to prepare peptide and of course okay, prepare your protein structure and models. So for the protein ligand, okay, you need to prepare protein structure or your model. Okay, but for protein peptide, okay, since you are ha you have been preparing for your peptide and your protein, you can sometimes also search for templates based on structure and interaction similarity if you could find a suitable protein structure or a model. So the next one again for protein ligand is to determine the location of the binding site and the binding mode, which is actually quite easy. Okay? But for the protein peptide, okay, you need to have a bit more patience because you need to determine it from the data set. So you need to search, to squawl, to squawl, uh, go through, get okay, a lot of uh, peptide databases sometimes okay, for that. Next, for protein ligand, okay, you just set up the docking parameters. And for protein peptide, okay, you just evaluate okay, the scoring results. That's it, okay, uh, once you have done it. So you evaluate the result for protein ligand okay, for protein uh, peptide, you just do a refinement okay, of the final structure. And this usually could be done by tweaking the binding site okay, to determine okay, the best score or to increase the best sc the score that you have obtained previously. All right, now, basically what are the challenges for peptides since I said that it is fairly new? Uh, up until now, there are not many peptide docking being published anyway, so that's why that is also one of the challenge. But the number one challenge okay, is actually pro protein hydrolysis itself. Because we know that uh, we need to have a peptide, and peptide okay, are only released by enzymatic hydrolysis and fermentation, which is susceptible to further hydrolysis, especially if it is done uh, manually or uh, wet lab. So it could result in decrease of bioactivity or degradation of the peptides. So probably you would have got the actual bio peptides, but okay, if it is susceptible to further hydrolysis, it will be chopped out and we don't have it anymore because it couldn't function. Okay, and it has been chopped into smaller peptides. So it needs to improve okay, hydrolysis method. So if you do protein hydrolysis in the wet lab, okay, do some uh, um, basically in vitro or in vivo analysis, so this needs to be done. 
Second problem or challenges, and this is always a challenge for protein work, reproducibility. Eh? So reproducibility in terms of peptides by microbial fermentation especially. Uh, usually for wild type, they okay, usually have uncontrollable properties because this is the wild type we are talking about, so they could change, they could adapt. So you need to improve the strain or you could produce a gene strain whereby you could control or you could determine the set characteristic. Apart from that, these are some of the other challenges that I could list. Probably there are more, but these are some of the things that I could think of. Using pure enzyme is usually better for hydrolysis, but of course will increase the cost because it's always very expensive. Hydrolyzed state usually showed higher bioactivity due to synergistic effects as compared okay, to when you digest it. So there is a difference between enzyme digestion and enzyme proteolytic. Okay, I will basically explain that in class if anyone would uh, remember it again and uh, basically remind me during our online meeting. Next is reduced bioactivity from single peptide. This is common especially if you were to perform it in a wet lab. And stability of generated peptides. So it is easily degraded, degraded in the gut especially. So it has no effect on the overall performance and it would of course require stabilization strategies to make sure that it is not being well digested or ingested by the proteolytic enzyme okay, in the gut so the next one okay, is actually stuck at clinical trial especially for ENTs antimicrobial peptides so there are limitations to topical application okay, which means that when you apply it uh, directly on the skin for example because again okay, uh, short half-life okay, has been demonstrated in the systemic administration which means that it doesn't last for a long time and that is usually the case okay, for topical but there's nothing you can do because unless you could like I said okay, there are two mechanisms just now if you could induce or modulate okay, the immune system then probably yes okay, you could have it for a longer period of time and the last one I put over here is specific versus general peptide database with the increased number of peptide databases there comes a problem in terms of error and basically in terms of ingenuity so some of them are very specific some of them are very general the problem is actually with the general peptide databases they just accept everything upload everything that have been deposited and it could cause more problems than gain so i would basically just conclude i think this is the last line anyway okay, on the future perspective of peptides so uh, we know that peptides okay, is useful in functional foods and functional foods are usually for healthy diets so there are effects and people are more aware of this okay, so you need to be very careful okay, before you adopt this kind of food okay, in your diet or when you change your diet or some type of doctor especially if you have some other illnesses bioactive effects from food hydrolysis Okay, so usually it needs a further study, especially for in vivo. A lot of in vitro studies have been done, but in vivo, again, like I said, okay, because of the problem of ethical committees, so uh, study is still being halted okay, in some stage. The next is multifunction bioactivity. Okay, but the component involved or contribute is actually unknown. We know that uh, just as the actual protein, okay, the peptides that come from protein could have more than one activity. But okay, how? It could contribute the okay, case is actually unknown and the mechanism of effect of bioactive peptide is still unknown for a lot of them especially for the EMPs usage of genetically improved strain okay, plus the development is probably something again okay, that people will think of in the future you guys again okay, the younger generations regulation of food derived bioactive peptides in nutraceuticals okay I think this is going to be implemented soon because people are more aware of this have you ever heard of collagen peptide so that is actually becoming famous especially in the us and i think quite becoming famous in malaysia nowadays as well and the last one is actually well in dear to our heart yeah, which is by informatics docking and simulation of peptide protein to provide more information because we actually lack those information like i said earlier on so there you have it again okay? peptides okay as simple as possible